Welcome to the podcast where we track down Australian war veterans, have a chat with them and hear their stories. I'm Alex Lloyd and this is Life on the Line. The Bible was the rule of the day. My jaw was broken. I could feel my molars in the centre of the mouth. We're in a take country. We're out there. At the end of the day, everyone is their job. wearing green is a soldier. Getting yourself blown up does some interesting things to you. Yeah. Uh, a place like the Middle East is constantly There's changing. The what we do there is constantly changing. We killed, though. And this, the thing was our own minefield. He held me up with a broken whiskey bottle and machete. Welcome to another bonus episode taken from our archive. Today you'll hear an interview between Angus Horden and World War II veteran Arthur Party. We interviewed Arthur on 21 June 2012. Arthur had some interesting stories on what it was like going to school during the Great Depression. Here's one of them. You know, 1933, 34, and, and uh, it was it was pretty pretty tight, the food situation there. And uh, in my case, I used to hang around the common room and uh, keep an eagle eye until I felt that there were no masters in the common room or nearby. And I'd do a lightning raid into the common room, grab the sandwiches or a scone or whatever was there and disappear as fast as I could go. And uh, that was a, quite a, an addition to what we might have had at lunch or dinner. When the war began, Arthur left his father's flour mill and joined the Air Force. During training though, his father wasn't too far behind. I missed out on what would have been my last year at school, which was, you might say, your glory year in uh, football, cricket, etc. And also, uh, I missed the opportunity of doing the leaving. And that also uh, could have been um, a disappointment in later years for things, uh, activities you, you may have wanted to take in, in the commercial world. Anyway, I started working just as a cleaner, you might say, in our flour mill in Tamora. I was put on a night shift. We only ran two shifts because we didn't have enough blokes to do that. And uh, I used to work from five in the afternoon until three in the morning. And I did that for 51 weeks before the Air Force called me. And when they did, it was the happiest day of my life. <laughs> so you left at the flour mill and you started your Air Force training. Tell us a bit about that. Yes, well, I, I went to Bradfield and um, things went all right there. And uh, uh, when the time came for post postings, the uh, CO said, and party uh, to 10 AFTS tomorrow. And he added a bit more and said, there's a lucky man going to his hometown. So I don't know how the hell he got to know. But anyway, I went on to tomorrow to 10 AFTS. Fortunately, in the time I was working in the flour mill, I'd had the chance to join the Air Training Corps. And that had afforded me the opportunity of, of um, having two or three short flights out at the uh, aerodrome, which was a training ground for the RAAF. So when I got to Tamora, I wasn't entirely uh, new to flying, although I'd only had perhaps an hour or something like that. But I managed to go solo in, in the minimum time of seven hours. My father used to come out in the car and he'd know what plane I was in. And when I'd ring up at night, I'd, he'd say, well, the first landing wasn't too bad, but the second one, I, you bounced a bit. I didn't think the second one was so good, so he acted as a sort of chief flying instructor while I was learning to fly at Tamora. Perhaps the only other thing of any great consequence there was I'd not done uh, geog I'd done geography and history at school and not uh, science at all. So I was pretty uh, thin with my knowledge. And in fact, I got the lowest mark in the history of the Tamora uh, 10 EFTS in theory of flight. But despite that, I managed to get through all right. And then I went on to Erin Quinty and uh, we uh, learnt to, to fly whirlways 
and my course was the first to land, instead of landing up the drogue, we had to land on a strip, cross country sort of thing, or cross wind you might say, out, um, out in one of the satellite aerodromes. But that all went okay. Uh, we had a pretty rough course. We had 75 started, five killed and 25 scrubbed, and only about five got commissions out of the 75 that started. Actually, while I was at Erin Quinty, I went to 10 funerals. There were five of our own colleagues and five from other courses. So, you know, it wasn't, um, it wasn't uh, a lay down Mazir when you, you started training in the Air Force. Certainly with Wirrawais. Wirrawais were getting a bit old and not all that re reliable. And, um, you know, it, it, uh, it, you, you began to realise that, you know, there was some danger in this sort of business. Arthur initially had a defensive posting in England before flying with the Desert Air Force. He flew a good number of sorties as a fighter pilot, but he never let the seriousness of war dispirit his boyish cheek, which did get him into trouble on one occasion, but not with the enemy. First night I was in Cairo, or well, first day I was in Cairo, several of my colleagues came out of uh, an a, a entertainment area there and they were dressed in, in officers' uniforms, which they'd borrowed. And of course, I was unaware of this sort of caper, and they said we'd been in this Club Bardia, Opera Bardia, and it's pretty good in there, and, but it's, uh, I think it's officers only. So I rolled my sleeves up and, and uh, took my forage cap off and went up to the entrance, and endeavoured to pay to go in, and to be British MPs came up and said to me, um, do you know this is officers only? And seeing my colleagues retreating fairly smartly, dressed in officers' uniforms, I, I said to him, what makes you think I'm an officer? So the other fellow pipes up and said, ah, you're making a statement to the effect that you're an officer when you're not an officer, you're under arrest. So I get trundled into the Black Mariah. Anyway, I came up for a uh, for uh, attention by the CO there, and um, he said, you're, you're charged with four charges, making a statement to the effect you're an officer when you are not an officer, not showing your badges of rank, having your sleeves rolled up in a malarial area, and using obscene language. So how do you plead? So I pleaded not guilty, and. An adjutant came around and said, look, we know the story. It would be, I think, better that you plead guilty because, you know, we really know what happened. So very reluctantly, I pleaded guilty. But that by this time, all the rest of the fellows that I was with had gone into the Heliopolis Palace Hotel and uh, they were as happy as hell. And when I got in there a week later, they said, ah, party, you're last here. You'll be last out. <laughs> So I went and applied for leave and I went up to, um, to Jerusalem and Tel Aviv and Nathania along the coast up to Beirut, which I thought was the finest city I'd ever been in. And then I went skiing in Bashare in the cedars of Lebanon and then went up to Tripoli in the far north of uh, Syria and came on back and uh, got back to uh, the Heliopolis Palace Hotel only to find there'd been no postings and they were all as mad as hell. I only came back two or three days and everybody else got the idea that they might as well have leave. So about 300 blokes went off on leave and a couple of days later the postings came through and the first bloke posted for the old party. So it was a real turnaround. Arthur is still that same good-humoured, cheeky fellow today. Arthur was interviewed for a documentary miniseries I directed and our Thistle Productions team spent five years researching, filming and producing. The doco is called For School and Country and it was supported by Knox Grammar School and their old boys group, the Old Knox Grammarians Association. We were also supported and endorsed by the Honourable Dr Brendan Nelson, director at the Australian War Memorial. Dr Nelson was interviewed for the documentary and launched it at Knox in May 2015 www.forschoolandcountry.com Thanks for listening to this bonus episode of Life on the Line. 
You can email us at podcast at lifeonthelinepodcast.com and see a couple of photos from Arthur's wartime service on Facebook and Instagram at Life on the Line Podcast. And if you know a veteran serviceman or servicewoman with a story to tell, please get in touch. We would love to have them on the podcast. Life on the Line is brought to you by Thistle Productions. Artwork by Big Cat Design. Music by Dan Van Workoven. Thanks for listening, and lest we forget. Mm-hmm.